Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on the right side here on Gripped. I am here with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwyer. It is a beautiful Sunday. It's the 29th of the ninth month, which is the month before October, whose name I've totally forgotten. This... September. That's not important, Michael. We've moved on. Seven. I've broken my flow. It was actually an important day. I will... Why is it an important day, Michael? It's an anniversary. Uh, of course it's an anniversary, but is it an important anniversary? Forty years ago today, on this, the Feast of St. Michael, as you well know, John Paul II became the first Pope to come to Ireland, and had quite a tumultuous reception. And I just think it would be... I mean, for all of our listeners out there, all of our listeners indeed, it would be interesting to reflect on the degree... And the foreseeability of the degree and magnitude of the changes that have taken place between that day when a million and a half people, half the population of the country, turned out to see him say Mass in the Phoenix Park. O Gary O Tempora O Mores, we live in changed, uh, changed times. I'm going to start cutting your microphone until after the intros from now on. Jolly good. Anyway, the... Today, we will hear the stories we want to cover today. The government has announced new regulations, which will increase the cost of all new builds by roughly 2% of building costs from the 1st of November. So if you're building... That's a government a, estimate. No, that's the government estimate. Not the builder's estimate. Yeah, I talked to a couple of uh, industry chaps. That's not their estimate. No, no. There have been calls for a vaping ban based on a illness which is going around America. We want to talk briefly on that. We talked about this before and how that illness is actually related to people smoking unregulated THC uh, cartridges, but we want to go through that again, the calls for the bans. Uh, and then we want to talk about a little bit of work that the Edinburgh Burke Institute had actually done over the last while, put in a, a pre-budget submission a while ago there. And on it, we touched on two actually quite important issues, one of tax certainty and one on the fact that uh, Fine Gael, the current ruling right-wing party's tax policies, <laughs> are actually to the left of what Jeremy Corbyn, the communist in, and leader of the British Labour Party, wants to bring in, yes. which is... Uh, Something I just... We'd never checked it because we assumed that would be ridiculous. But no, it's correct. This is true, this is true. Jeremy Corbyn wants a lower rate of personal income tax than Leo. But let's go to the building regulations. So the building regulations come into force from the 1st of November. What they mean is that your new houses currently... Houses currently have to be built to what's called an A3 BER rating, which is energy efficiency rating. Yes. They're going to have to be built to an A2 rating, which I'm told is effectively twice as energy efficient. This is happening despite the fact that we are... We have one of the most high bars for energy efficiency in house building in the world. When I was researching this, I found multiple indexes which uh, grade you on building regulations. Ireland scored 100 out of 100 on uh, energy efficiency regulations. So I don't know what's going to happen now that we've just doubled them. 200 out of 100? Have we broken the indexes? Uh, If we're talking about... Saving people, and then the government will say, oh, you will save money, you will save money because we have made your house even more energy efficient. Now, the first thing I'm sceptical about that, if we are, and this is the principal source of the saving and the principal aspect of the design, is to save money on heating. Because the standards that had been already imposed were so high that it would be, it had become, except if you talk to architects, and you're talking about a new build or a retrofit, they say, no, you don't need you won't need that. You won't need this because with the this house will be so efficient. This house will be so well designed when it comes that you that you will be toasty warm all year round. That there, there won't be any need for that. Oh, and that's that's actually that. something to mention as well because it's not just new builds. If you have a house and you're undergoing uh, major renovations, you will be forced to bring that house up to at least a B two energy rating. A major renovation is any renovation that uh, involves over 25% of the structure. So it doesn't involve things like uh, painting or or things of that nature. But if you're doing um, like an extension or something like that, you may actually run into it. And it is also the fact that very often retrofitting, particularly in Ireland, will be more expensive than building from new. And as I, I, I saw an example of myself recently 
of a fairly large renovation, where I said, in then two thirds of the total cost of the build, the renovation build, was actually having to conform, bring the building up to conform with, with the energy standards. It was an amazing if result. you're if you're in an older building and you want to do it up uh, and some of that is structural work you could easily find yourself going into this in which case you are going to have to have someone come out and independently verify that you've done it um and when I looked at how much it would cost to bring kind of an older or an average home to a zero energy standard uh, on average it's thirty to forty thousand and that was before yeah. these new regulations came in. So if you accidentally cross over from renovation into major renovation, you are going to have a whale of a time. You, you, you generally need to be serious, seriously careful about that. The question is, and, and which doesn't seem to have been asked, is why? They're, they're going to the basis, well, it's like the, the idiot with medicine. Well, if two spoons of this will do me good, then five spoons must be even... Well, we must be, must, must be so much better. I could give you the government reason, or I could give you the reason I actually think it is. You can give me the government reason, and then we the, can laugh the at that. The government reason on. is that they want to reduce, um, they want to help fight climate change by making housing more efficient, and they want to reduce rates of fuel poverty, which is a situation in which you struggle to afford to heat your house. Yeah, the house you can't get, or buy, or build, because of the cost. Yeah, that would seem to be the falling point, that um, that the houses you now can't afford to buy are very cheap to run, which seems irrelevant if you can't actually buy them. Well, I feel it's a great, it's a great source of comfort to the, the homeless and the unhoused mm. when they see mm. people building houses and they think, oh, no, I know you're spending four or five hundred thousand on that, but at least I'm, you'll be toasty warm and you'll be saving the environment. And I'm delighted about that. And it's got to be cheap, cheap to run for you. And I think that's jolly good now that you've spent all this money building that house. Even though I myself will never, ever be able to afford a house. Mm. So that is the government. That is the government excuse. Now, this is, this is happening, Gary. Just why are we always talking about this? Well, just to give a, pra- a practical uh, elucidation of what, what's going on in the country. This week gone by... McCroom in West Cork and Carlo in Carlo have been added to the lists of rent pressure zones. In other words, they're now going to fall under the purview of the, in, at the present fairly weak, uh, rent control act legislation that the government has brought in. Now, this is a reaction to the fact that, so, that rents in McCroom, for example, have been up, I think, something like twenty percent over the course of a year, and you're renting a small house now. You're up to eight hundred a month. So RTE go down. They look around. And they say, yes, it's it's hard to get a house in McCroom, and they go to the local estate agents and say, well, this is this, this is going to help, and the estate agents say, well, actually, this isn't going to help a damn bit. The problem with McCroom is, and I suspect we we know, in fact, like the rest of the country, is availability of houses, the market, the supply. This will do nothing, nothing to increase supply. If anything, in fact, it's going to reduce it because at a point where while rents are going higher, the market and sale of houses is actually stabilising and dropping off because a natural point, price points have been achieved within the market that people just can't afford. Between the banking regulations for, for mortgage Mortgages and the amount that people need to save up to get the deposit, at the same time as spending a thousand or more on rent, which is a tricky trick to pull off if you can. So anyway, the government has now decided to just right at this point something which is going to make houses yet more expensive and do nothing except, in fact, potentially reduce the new supply coming onto the market. So well done, government. So I just on. Um this point you might be thinking like how can a small increase in price if this only adds two percent which is the government estimate and let's assume it's correct well their estimate is actually 1.9 but let's say two percent because even if it's correct it's not going to be 1.9 so it adds two percent you might go well surely that's only a small matter a small increase and it is like it could be 
let's say four to ten thousand, depending on the house you're going for, assuming the government estimates are correct. But the the other problem you run into is the lending limits on mortgages. Mm-hmm. So you can only get three point five times your income, which means that there are always going to be people who can just about afford a mortgage. Now they can they can absolutely afford to pay it down. They probably paying more in rent than they would pay on the mortgage. But the banks will simply not lend them more money than that. So every time you move the uh, the cost of new bills up, you knock out some of those people who, while technically able to afford the mortgage repayments, cannot get uh, more than more from the bank. So if it yeah. goes up 5,000, they might not be able to reach that 5,000. So you'll just knock out a layer of people. And the problem is the government have done this multiple times with different policies, and every time you just knock out more and more people. So it is um, it is largely a pointless policy. I think it has been implemented by the government purely so that they can say they're doing something. And I saw the press conference, and they were allowed to get away with this sort of, you know, well, we'll save time over the... we'll save money over the long run. And no one seems to realize the front loading this cost in the Irish system is actually disastrous. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if you'll save money over the long term because it's the upfront sticker price that determines whether or not you can get the mortgage to begin with. Yeah, they're, they're saying that you're gonna say you're gonna be saving money when you're in your fifties and sixties. Which not for everybody, but for most people is also the time when they're going to be at their wealthiest. As opposed to the time when they're trying to buy a house, when they're at their poorest, and that's when you decide to put in the extra cost. That makes wonderful sense. Yeah, we, we were, I think we were quoted in Crypt about this. So we just used the same Mercedes um, yeah. thing we use every time. Analogy. God, that is a, that is just a evergreen analogy of the Irish housing market. It's, it's absolutely right, and... and the problem is that because it's <laughs> it's a classic example of rather of a, some of a, rather than something which has been taken away, it's something that doesn't happen. It's these are the houses that don't get built. These are the people that don't get housed. These are the people <coughs> that don't buy because it's not uh, something where you're taking something away or you're reducing something vi- physically that already there. People don't get so exercised about it in the same way as you they would if, for example, we walked out and got rid of eighty. 80% of the cars off the road. Hmm. And for, for for listeners who haven't heard that before, the general explanation is, if I say to you that Mercedes are the safest cars on the road, if I am the government in this case, and I say therefore that we can only have cars with the highest standard of safety on the road because we care about safety, because we have to care about safety or people die, and therefore only Mercedes will be allowed on the road you won't create a situation in which everyone in Ireland drives a Mercedes. You'll create a situation in which the vast majority of Ireland, of people in Ireland can't afford to drive. And that's exactly what's happened with building regulations. We have these fabulous, like world-class building regulations that will give beautiful, long-lasting buildings that are incredibly energy efficient. And the problem is, is it turns out that also has driven our rental market totally mad because people can't actually afford homes and homelessness is spiralling totally out of control. But the houses that exist are beautiful. There's also the question about regarding the construction of uh, social and affordable housing. I remember having a conversation with a politician about this and he just blindly said, as if this was an obvious matter of fact, well, of course, all of the houses that are going to be built, either for, by local government or by the state or for social and affordable housing have to be built to the very highest spec possible. And this is part of the same disease. And he was genuinely surprised when I said, no, that's, no, they don't. All across the world, in every single, fa- in every single facet or factor uh, of construction or design, we make choices and we regularly constantly, in fact, choose to build less than the best thing we can build, less than the the perfect thing we can build, because to build it implies, implies costs, which is going to mean that instead of getting 50 of this thing, we only get one of this thing, and <coughs> trains, <coughs> trains and airplanes, <coughs> air engineers know precisely, they can graph out precisely, the the amount 
the oh the the, the, the point at which the the craft becomes safer and you can actually say this will save this number of lives this will save this number of lives this will save this. to the as you get to the top point you're talking about x extra millions and millions of pounds to save one life every 20 years or something and it's not very pleasant or nice but people make decisions and say well no we're not going to do that because that would actually have a negative effect on the other side because people you're going to actually have negative effects on people's health or well-being by the lack of the access to the transport <coughs> but the government have this notion oh no 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 because it sells well because journalists never actually challenge them on it they never actually say why just a simple why why do we have to have that? Would be nice. But at that press conference, Gary, I don't, I don't imagine we heard any journalists asking why. They just nodded and said, yes, good thing. Well, occasionally occasionally you do see, well, mostly it is just nodding dogs, but occasionally you do see someone ask why. The problem then is that the government will go, because of this totally spurious reason, and then they'll go, okay, that's fine then. Anyway, moving on. Yes. So we now have we now have senators. Uh, Excuse me. You sound like you're dying. Oh well, it's just a little. I mean, we're all dying, moment. but you sound like you've expediated the process. No, no, it's just uh, I'll be fine after a cup of tea. Did you consider a cup of tea before this? Um, I didn't feel like I was dying before this. My death seems to have cropped up in the middle of it. Anyway, James Riley particularly has said that we should ban flavored uh, vapes. I'm not sure if vapes or vape cartridges. I, I don't know. I don't know what the terminology here, because they are um, they're attractive to young people. Senator Noon has also been worried about this, by the way, which is reassuring, because Senator Noon is worried about everything. Senator Noonan has one response to items of concern, and that is to ban them. Ban it! Ban it! Ban it now! Down with this kind of thing! Yeah, anyway, in this case, it's it's it's, it's Senator Riley, and he wants the. <coughs> Because, because apparently, the introduction of flavors such as uh, wild or sour cherry, green apple, and melon are attractive to children, and I can I can see that, Gary, because as you know, children are notoriously attracted to eating fresh to eating fresh fruit. You you put down them. You want to capture a couple of kids. You get them into your your child trap. Put in some nice juicy gallia melon or some papaya. They can't resist it. No, oh, fruit. Go mad for it. Yeah, the only the only problem is is that we've actually started to see studies about how many non-smokers have taken up vaping. And so, what are we talking about? Non-smokers have taken up. Um, based on my reading of a number of politicians talking about this, we're talking about what, 20, 30, 35 percent of school kids. So, of if you look at the studies on rates of e-cigarette use amongst non-smokers, the results range from 0.1% to the highest I found was 1.6. 0.1% is 1.6%. Yeah, of the general population who've never smoked will take up vape. Doesn't sound like an awful lot now, but maybe it is really. I mean, I don't smoke, and I did try, I think I tried a vaping machine once just to see what it's like, but it ran into the same problem with uh, smoking. I don't like the feel of smoke in my lungs. Yeah, and that's the thing. The only people who like the feel of smoke in their lungs are people who smoke, really, realistically. Uh, you will get people... The other thing you have to rem- look When you look at the figures of the number of people who are vaping, right? It's a, it's, it's like it's, in similar studies. You have to remember that you they, they don't give you... F- they don't tell you how long people persist. I mean, that's the other thing. Some of, some of the studies that have really been pushing the idea of young people doing it are asking things like, have you ever used one? Exactly. And yeah. lots of people there... have used them like once or twice. And they went, I actually just don't like this feeling. But if you ask that and you don't put any time limit on it and you don't ask, do you use it? It was very easy to sort of push this quite wide. A lot of people will try something once then deeply regret it, never do it again. My mother, I'm told, my mother voted for the Labour Party back in the fifties. So you know, people can get, people can recover. Some people um, are saying that well, if if young people do pick up vaping, they're more likely to smoke. But it's very difficult to work that out because then you sort of go, well, are young people who picked up vaping just more likely to smoke anyway? Um, yeah. 
And I did see, like in the here's here's the thing about banning these things in general. We know, we don't know the full health impact of vaping. I think that's fair to say because it is a very is, new uh, product. That's a very new way of doing this. We yes. do, however, know the health impact of smoking. Smoking is very, 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 very bad for you. It's uncomplicated. Bad. Just a provisional analysis of what's in each of them. I think it is very fair to assume that vaping is, while still not healthy, significantly more healthy than the thing which directly puts tar into your lungs. <laughs> there have been not many longitudinal studies because they haven't, they can't be because they have, the, the product is new, but there have actually been quite a few studies. And the better ones all say much the same thing. Listen, we don't know what the long-term effects are here. We are still working out what the effect what the the, the, the the effects of the complexity and the uh, the the relationship between the gel, the the gel and the high heat and what that may produce, but we're still looking at something which looks like being in ninety seven ninety eight percent safer than smoking cigarettes and ninety seven or ninety eight percent smoking but also the figures for people who give up smoking using vaping as opposed to cold turkey are using Nicorette products. Yeah. Are actually pretty, they, pretty they good. They are pretty good because the, the actual figures for most other ways of quitting smoking are quite bad. But in, let's say, the UK, the NHS says that since vaping and various e-cigarette options and heat not burn, and I, I don't, no involvement in this, I don't really understand the differences between these technologies. I've been told them, but I, I don't use them, so I don't really care. Sure. Um, the NHS figures are that an estimated... 1.5 million vapors have, uh, or people who vape, whatever the, the nomenclature is, have stopped smoking cigarettes. Yeah, now there are those you know, who, who will continue to both vape and smoke, and the campaigners will say, look, well, it, but actually this, they represent a very small percentage. And these, in a sense, these, these, these are, shall we say, the hardcore, the recidivists anyway. What we have to look at is not so much them, but the numbers of the large, significantly large numbers of people who succeed in getting off cigarettes be, with the help and staying off cigarettes long term with the help of vaping, and that's again an important thing. No, I mean, I it doesn't like I, it doesn't bother me if people smoke, right? but for people like James Riley, who, of course, would only ever do what is best for the Irish Health Service and would never in any way introduce policies that would uh, destroy it. I True. I think it, figures like this should kind of give them a sense that it doesn't look like young people are taking it up in massive quantities. Non-smokers are not taking it up in massive quantities. And it is saving people's lives. And therefore, a ban on it. I know Jay, he's only talking about flavoured cartridges so far. But... Yeah, that's him. Other people are calling for a straight-up ban. Yeah. But I think on... And yeah, we've had... Uh, was it the university president of... Uh, University of Limerick came out calling for them to be banned on all, all campuses. The the United Nations Health Organization on talk, talking on the subject, and we discussed this a few months ago. Pretty well close to looking for a global ban. On the World Health Organization supports a ban on vaping yeah. products. For and when you go through the document, genuinely not being sarky or picky here, you can't find a reason why. I actually, I, I think the reason, I think the reason why is this. For decades, we've had kind of highly funded NGOs, health professionals, uh, the World Health Organization, UN, various bodies, all trying to get people to stop smoking, and they've all failed spectacularly. And then this thing comes along, which was invented by, I believe, some Chinese inventor. Yes. And it actually starts working. That kind of shows that. They kind of pissed away decades and billions of euro in public health funding. Yeah, well, and got shown up by some Chinese lad in a garage. That's that's, that's, yeah, that's life. Yeah, but the, anyway. the these people don't like that. They're the people who save you, not the market, or not some guy who just no. wants to make money. That's okay with an idea. So yeah, it, the ban I think is a bad idea. I think if we just let these things develop, 
we'll kind of see these things go fairly well. And also, these are still very early days in uh, vaping technology. It'll be interesting to see what way these things develop and ways they can be made safer again, um, which I think is interesting. Also, yes, as we covered previously, the, the illnesses and the deaths that have occurred in America, all of those have been linked to um, black market THC capsules rather than the actual vaping itself. So as we said in the episode, please do not smoke your marijuana in a non-FDA approved way. Yeah, I would go for FDA approved. Mm, mm. So for your bong. On to some work we actually did with the Edinburgh Institute. We put in yes. a pre-budget submittal there uh, a little bit ago. And that talked about a couple of things. We, we'd made some, not demands, but some points such as it might be a good idea to have a referendum to put the corporate tax rate in the constitution, because that's just the way we roll. <laughs> Protected from those messages. The, 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 I think before we talk about the, the, the tax rates, just bring people's attention, because I think this is something that people just don't know about or they've vaguely heard about, is the question of tax certainty. When I say tax certainty, I'm not talking about the... The, although that's an important one, which is the certainty that the corporate tax rate will be and remain 12.5%. But the fact that you get an assessment for your the amount of tax that you're due to pay for a year or whatever, as a company or as a citizen, and you pay it, you go along. But it doesn't necessarily end there, because it can be... It's, it's, now, historically, this didn't happen very often. It happened very rarely indeed, historically. That revenue would come back and look at a case again and say, actually, we think that there was a mistake made here. We're going to reassess what the liability is and you have to pay a little bit more or a lot more. Our concern is that we're looking at a situation now where it's becoming far more and more common. Revenue is becoming more and more aggressive. Now, I'll give you two examples. One is a, one's a big one, which is a recent one. But one's a small one. Sorry, around eight years ago, I was working with a senator who had been, who had opened a, an office, shall we say, a constituency office, having first inquired of revenue whether or not it would be acceptable for him to set this cost off as a <coughs> business expense, work expense. So they said, yeah, that's fine. Five years later, they came back and said, yeah, you know, we have thought about that, which, you know, it's nice to think they think about us. And we've decided, no, we can't do that because of various reasons. And uh, we want our money. And we think we want to get some interest and some penalties as well. Even though they were the original arbiter who said that this was okay, without any necessary explanation, they can go back, change their minds, and remain the single arbiter of deciding whether or not you have to pay them. Now, a company, a large American company called Perigo, went through this process, had consulted with the tax, tax authority, negotiated different rates of taxation, but also VAT, depending on what kind of services they were selling. And even when the agreement was nailed down, they got a letter from the then Minister for Finance that saying this was the agreed rate. They've now been reassessed, and reassessed to this point of 1.6 billion of an exposure. Now, Gary, I put it to you that 1.6 billion is a lot of money. It's the kind of money that should be making people sit up and take notice, particularly foreign companies that are looking to invest in Ireland, potentially. Our companies even that are here might go elsewhere. Yeah, it's it's an astronomical sum. But I think I think to focus on the, the first example you gave of um, of the politician, it's not... Revenue will tell you to do something, they will sign off mm. on it, you will plan for it, you will budget on it, and then you may spend money that, if they had told you was due to the, to be paid to them, you wouldn't have spent. Yeah. And then when they come back, it's your problem. Like, it's your Absolutely fault. Absolutely your problem. And yeah. if you go, well, I didn't know I needed that money because you told me I... You, you said you needed X, I got Y, yeah. so I spent the difference between X and Y because it was my money. And they'll go, well, that doesn't matter. You need to find that amount of money again. Your ignorance is absolutely no defense. No, but the fact we've made a total cock and balls of it, that's not going to impact on us at all. That's going to impact on you. So revenue, like in two, the, the, the figures, we, we were able to pull figures from this, and they've been growing at a startling rate. They're called upward tax reassessments. 
And some of those are going to come back because revenue says uh, you made a mistake. But when you look at the the figure increases in them, people haven't yes. suddenly started making more and more mistakes. Revenue is just getting more and more aggressive about this. So in 2015, there were 337 assessments of high net worth individuals and corporate entities. Okay. Then in 2016, it's 458. In 2017, 664. In 2018, 915. And we don't know what the figures are going to be for uh, 2019 yet. So that is a, that's 300% in four years it's gone up. Yeah, that's impressive. And it would indicate a change in direction and policy. And it's one of those things, it's, it's one of those stories that are really important, but are not really sexy to the general public. And the thing here is that, there are companies, or there are countries in Europe that have lower tax rates, corporate tax rates than Ireland does now. The days when we were the lowest are long gone. But then you look at what Leo and people like that are saying, and they will openly tell people that there are countries that have lower tax rates than we do. But what we do we is we offer stability. Yes, certainly. And here's the thing. If you have a multinational and they want to spend, they have a 10-year expansion project, and it's going to cost $20 billion euro they want to know what they're paying and if they can't figure out what they're paying well maybe they go somewhere else so stuff like this is actually quite damaging because it can be the difference between you know a new plant opening in cork or limerick or something like that that services the local area and you know is a big local employer yeah and that just not happening and And, and, and it's, it's very important as you say for the large companies i would also personally want to emphasize that it's really, really bad for this, just for the ordinary individual citizen. Because you're up against, you're up against the state here. You're the little guy. And you're going to have to try and pursue a case in the high court to defend yourself against this, which is the last place in the world you want to be when you're trying not to spend money. I, 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 anyway, this it's offence. It, it means that the, uh, you can never be completely confident that you're being compliant. You can never know for a certainty whether or not you're obeying the law. And because the, the, the absurdity of the heart of this is the arbiter, there's actually only one arbiter to whether or not you are tax compliant, and that is revenue. Mm. And revenue can say that on Monday you're compliant, but on Friday you're not compliant, even though your status has not changed at well, all. Well, to be fair, it's only their, their opinion. That's actually the best outcome, because you won't have time to spend the money you thought you made. I speak Whereas if they come back to you five years down the line and go, exactly. for five yeah. years we've been telling you to put through the wrong tax, mm-hmm. so we hope you now have five years of back tax with interest to pay us. No, I wouldn't. Now, if you're, and the thing is, these are all, these, the figures we have are for companies, large companies, and high net worth individuals. Mm. We don't have figures for how often revenue is doing this to, say, people who are just self employed. Yeah. But it's entirely no. possible that the same thing is happening, that revenue has told people who are just small local business people that, you know, they've called and went, look, is this, can I put this through? And revenue went, yeah, and in five or however many years they're going to get back and go, we were wrong. You now owe us basically five years of an additional tax bill, and you better be able to pay us now. <laughs> yes, that you, and it has to be now because it's, we're not waiting on. Now, I would the one a slight question here. I, 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 revenue, uh, uh, let's face it, revenue is not inhabited by monsters and villains. Uh, the people in the action were very lucky, generally speaking, in in the public service and learned that. People in revenue and people say it's vast and whatever. They tend to be very, very nice, very decent, very helpful. They're genuinely mostly out of the time. I mean, anytime you, you deal with them, wanting to help you do what you need to do. And they're very friendly about it. It seems to me this is a policy change. This is not a natural level. This is, and that policy is coming from somewhere. Now, it may be coming from the top of revenue, or it may be coming from government, but wherever it's coming from, the, the policy has, if we're not going to actually secure this legislatively, then the policy has to change. And for that to change, we need people to become more aware of this. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people we talked to thought that this was some sort of, um, that they thought the the Apple case had made them look bad, and that they were now going to basically try and find examples so that other people would... Uh, they basically restore that re- revenue's reputation, but then when we found the actual figures, they're just doing it to hundreds of people. Yeah, 
That's an answer being really since you as in a sense on the face of it slightly scattered though. Also, from talking to people because you're never most people are not going to tell you this has happened. They're not going to make a big deal of it because they're going to want to appeal it and they want to do it quietly and they are absolutely not going to want to piss off revenue. And that was when we talked to companies about this and we talked to people about this. <laughs> That was a constant theme, the fear of pissing off revenue. Yeah. And there is a little bit of, well, sh- you shouldn't have to worry about pissing off revenue because revenue should just be like, totally impartial. Mm-hmm. But the general the general idea was we cannot afford to piss these people off because if we piss them off, this is going to get a lot of worse. But some of the stuff we were hearing about how revenue was acting towards these companies, like companies who were in, they would, they would pay something, revenue would come back and say, well... Your last five years have been wrong, and the company would write to them and go, "Can you explain how it's wrong? We we kind of want to just figure this out because some of these are just massive bills." And yes. revenue would basically go, "No, we'll see you in court," <laughs> and that's just it. Uh, yeah, she's not, she's not the most helpful. Yeah. Yeah. or people kind of going, "You know, this is going to have massive impact on our company because this is." Like, this is five years of a tax bill at once. Like, this, we might have to sack people. We might have to downsize. We could... Yeah. Like, what are we meant to do? And revenue would just be like, appeal it. Yeah. You, you know where the court yeah, is. Yeah, like, just bring on. us to court. And the, the thing is, and this is not particular to revenue, but it's it's a tr- it's true of all government departments pretty well, that they are perfectly, generally speaking, happy just to keep going back to court day after day, month after month, year after year. Because at the end of the day, while... For you, this is a horrific experience and a financially crippling experience. For a government, for a government body going to court, it's, yeah, it's just what we but do. But it's weird because revenue for the last couple of years, like revenue used to be nightmarish to deal with. But then over the last while, probably around, um, would it be around when, uh, was it John Moran came into finance? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe a little bit before that. Revenue actually, from my perspective, became quite pleasant to deal with. And they, they knew what was happening and they knew what you needed to pay and they were fairly communicative. And if you yeah. called them, you could actually talk to a person. Yeah. So this is a weird back step for revenue to go from... And that kind of worked for everyone. It wasn't that they were... You know, they weren't going to do you a favour kind of friendly, but their aim was just to you know get the money from but you it, and just move it, on. Yeah, it was... A culture, of, a, fr- a friendly, helpful culture. Now, uh, as regards paying taxes, as we know, you don't have to be paying corporation tax to be paying lots of tax in this country. We have the marginal rate. Now, I can never remember, is it, get this right, is it 49.5%? It's 14, most of the people who are, who are going to, uh, be paying at the top rate are going to be on 49.5%. It then goes to 52% once you cross one of the last, um, mm-hmm. One of the last thresholds, which I think is seventy thousand and forty-four euro. But the forty and a half percent is thirty-five thousand. Yeah, uh, thirty-five thousand three hundred. Three hundred. Yeah, you go in. So it's for it's like less than the average industrial wage. You, yeah, you get it. You get into that bracket. So once you once you hit. The, the average industrial wage, you're going to be paying 40% income tax. Then on top of that, you're going to be paying various things like the universal social charge, uh, pay-related social insurance, mm-hmm. sorry, yeah, PRSI. That's 4%, I think. So, yeah, on the average industrial wage, you come to a marginal rate of 49.5%. Now, remember, folks out there, just because this is something to look forward to, as we know, Finnegan are planning, I think, in 2021... The introduction of a compulsory seven percent pension levy. We have now. What is Jeremy Corbyn, Gary? So here's yeah. Propo- so here's proposing as the top rate of tax. Yeah. So here's the thing about the Irish tax rate. It is very high at a very low level. So there are other countries that have higher rates of tax, but you be earning hundreds of thousands before you pay them. Whereas in yes. Ireland. If you earn, let's say, 39000 which is just above the average industrial wage for a full-time industrial worker, you will be paying a 49.5% rate of tax. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, who is, again, a communist, and I don't mean that as a derogatory fashion, I mean he is literally a communist, he wants to put a tax of 45% on those earning £80,000 or more. Right. And of 50% on those earning 125000 
pounds or more. So in Ireland, you will be paying more than Corbyn's tax at the average industrial wage, and you'll be paying more than 50% at about 70,000. No, I may get this wrong, I don't know, but if memory serves me right, in high-tax France, you have to be earning over 150,000 before that bar, our marginal rate will come into effect. I think it's even higher. I think it's, it could, I think it's multiple it hundred thousand. But yeah, but here's the thing. <laughs> we, Finne, we have Fine Gael being led by people who were renowned for how right wing they were. Uh, you know, just low tax, low regulation, cut the state mm-hmm. before they got into power. Mm-hmm. We could transplant the British Labour Party elect a literal communist and most people in this country would get a tax cut. <laughs> they would be better off on, on, on their taxation. It is surprising. Yeah, yeah. Or is it? Well, it's it's a weird or thing. Is it, we've... Or is it just depressing? I don't know. It's one or the other. But... It's a straight... Like, we have in... I mean, the IMF, who are not known for their fiscal irresponsibility... Mm-hmm. They say that the the optimal marginal income tax rate is about 44%. Yeah. And the reason they say that is because when marginal rates go too high, that can have an impact on the actual economy of the country because people don't spend money because they have less money. Yeah. And that's and that's the important thing. We this this right-wing uh horror of government, you know, is not just it's not just this but they are planning away busily. Now, it's only in the last little while they started talking about tax cuts. They had up to that been holding line for saying we we don't need tax cuts, we should because we need to invest in, in services, which again is not the language one expects of a market party. We know that they're going to be they're looking at increases in like there was was we believe in the VRT for imported cars, there's going to be an increase in the uh, duty on fuel. Carbon tax. There's going, to be, there's going to be carbon taxes. There's going to be a pension levy. I mean, there are a slew of, tax, of taxes heading towards us and very little evidence at all, as of yet, of significant tax cuts elsewhere to remediate the effect of these, these not, the loss of income from these. So, I mean, just, just to, to push this point home, £80,000 is which is where Jeremy Corbyn wants to tax a 45%, is about €90,000, uh, slightly over. Mm-hmm. So Jeremy Corbyn wants to put in a tax of 45% at nearly three times the level at which we put in a 48% tax rate. That's right. I have that again. Jeremy Corbyn wants to put in yeah. a 45% tax rate at yeah. over €90,000. So that's nearly right. three times... Higher. Three times, yeah. Nearly, nearly three times three higher times. than yeah. when the Irish government, the right-wing Irish government, thinks it's appropriate to take 48%. And they're talking about an 8% pension levy, which would be spectacular. I think that is the moment when you hear the clamp, clamp, clamp of the feet. With the, the pikes... The pikes if you were on bonus. seventy thousand and they brought in that pension levy, yeah. you would pay sixty percent marginal tax, right? Sixty percent. And if this is the right wing government, the pro market government, it's also. I mean, I think of, like, I don't really. This government is neither right nor left. It is simply no, the worst government is. in living memory. <laughs> it's well, yeah. It it doesn't have it doesn't have a it doesn't have a core. It doesn't have a it doesn't have an ideology or a philosophy. I don't, see, like, I don't even get annoyed when they announce things anymore. It's just like, okay, that, that'll that take some time, yeah, okay. But that's what we're facing into, and uh, hopefully, well, either electoral failure or the pressures of the desire to say power will see some kind of mitigation. But for the time being, we're faced with being a high tax country and, the budget, and high taxed country. The budget will get, they're talking about tax cuts. It, yeah. <laughs> There is, I think it's about 2.6 billion of what they call fiscal space in the budget, of yeah. which I believe 2.1 billion has already been earmarked for increased spending as we go, as okay. we go into Brexit. We, we couldn't as even be bothered to push back the budget by a couple of weeks no, to see no, what would happen with Brexit. The fact that 
lot of most of Ireland are, are confidently predicting that it will drive us into recession, and the, we don't have any suggestions well, if, on how precisely we will pull out of it. But leaving that aside, this is this is the perfect it, time to spend two point one billion euro. Absolutely, on all sorts of. We, I do we need we need a high speed rail link. Between Dublin and Bray, that's what we should be spending our money on. I mean, as someone currently <coughs> residing in Greystones, I could, yeah, you know, I can get behind that. Or, or Greystones, let tell with it, Gary. You know, if we're going to spend it, let's bring it all the way to Greystones. Yeah, I think that makes a bit an awful lot of sense. Anyway, I'm looking out my window here. It's actually blue skies and white fluffy clouds. So I think it's time to get out there. Get a, get a coffee. This would be the go this to, would be the window I keep mass. telling you to record further away from because of the noise it lets through. Well, no, I'm facing away from the window. A likely um, story. Uh, <laughs> actually, what this morning? If you've got you know, you will see me dragging furniture around to try and see what what was the best way of testing noises. And none of it seems to make any brain bit of difference to me. But anyway, so I say, have a happy Sunday and have a happy week. We will talk to you in the coming week. And it's goodbye from me. All the best from me.